the Ostomy Nurse Project. Hello there listeners and welcome to another episode of the Ostomy Nurse Project. If you're tuning in for the first time, my name is Felicity and I talk to you about everything you want to know about life with a stoma. Whether you're a person who has a stoma yourself, you're a person who is contemplating stoma surgery, you're a friend or a loved one of somebody who does have a stoma, or if you're a healthcare professional or even a stoma nurse. Tuning into these episodes whenever you like via podcasting is a great way to pick up a little bit of extra info. And if you're listening to this episode, then you've already cottoned on to that, so thank you. Now, in last week's episode where we talked about mucocutaneous separation, that was referring to something that happens in the immediate stages post-operatively. So when you've just had a new stoma formed, that's a wound complication that can occur uh, in some cases after stoma formation. In this week's episode, though, we're going to take it back to something a bit more of a latent complication that can happen after surgery, and that is what we call parastomal hernia. Now, some of you may have heard of the term hernia in the past. You know, you might have a hernia in the groin or you might have what we call an incisional hernia, which is where you get a bit of a lump or a bulge um, in your body. And it's the same principle with a parastomal hernia. So a parastomal hernia appears as a lump or a a bulge or or a protrusion around your stoma. So either around it or beside it or in a certain area around the stoma. And it happens because the surgical incision into the abdomen goes through your abdominal wall, including your musculature, and that creates an area of weakness. So with your muscles, they are designed to pull and and support you and keep you upright. If we make a separation in that muscle and bring through a piece of bowel, that can create a weakened area and it's it's not foolproof. Surgical technique is wonderful, but what can happen is over time, that area that they've made a hole in between that muscle and down into your intestinal cavity can become weakened and that hole can stretch with lots of different reasons for that stretching. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later in the episode. But the idea is that hole can get bigger. And if the hole gets bigger or weaker, it can allow extra bits of bowel or parts of the inside of your abdomen to slip through. And it creates a lump or a bulge behind the stoma. Now, if you're a person who does have a stoma, or if you're a friend or a loved one or a carer of somebody that you suspect may have developed a parastomal hernia, there's a couple of ways to recognize if there is one there. And it can be a bit tricky because sometimes what can happen is you may develop a hernia. So you, if you have a stoma yourself, you may feel a little bit of a bulge or a lump, or you may notice that when you're wearing your pouch, it might protrude a little bit. From when you're sticking on your flange around your stoma, you may find that the protrusion or, or how far it sticks out may give you issues with adhesion of your ostomy pouch. Now, sometimes you may not notice initially if you do have a hernia because sometimes you can develop what we call a reducible hernia or a retractable hernia, which is a hernia that happens when there's pressure exerted on that weak point behind the stoma, but not necessarily when you're lying down flat. So sometimes if you're lying nice and flat, your tummy might look great. It might look nice and soft, no lumps or bulges. But when you go to sit or stand up, or cough or sneeze, you may then develop that protrusion or that lump around the stoma. So what happens is when you lie back down, that piece of bowel that slips through or creates that bulge manages to resolve and go back out of that hole and everything lies flat again. So that can be quite confusing. If you have a reducible hernia, you may not notice it all the time. Another way of finding out uh, if you have got a peristomal hernia is to pop a hand gently over your pouching system and either cough or sneeze. You may find in some cases that you may feel a bit of a lump or a protrusion coming through, but that's not as common a way of noticing if you have got a hernia or not. 
Subsequently, you can also get what we call non-reducible hernias, which are lumps and bumps and protrusions around your stoma that do not go away when you lie down. So the way to tell if you think you have a hernia is lie on your back or lie down flat for a couple of minutes. After a couple of minutes, have a check and see if there is still a bulge there. If not, if everything's nice and flat again, you may very well have what we call a reducible hernia. If that bulge does not go away and you still continue to have a lump around your stoma permanently, so 24 hours a day, that's an indication that it is a non-reducible hernia or an established hernia that cannot be pushed back into the abdominal cavity. And that poses some risks, which I'm going to talk about much later in the episode about what we do about hernias or the risk of having a hernia and what a hernia can mean in your stoma life. Now, for any healthcare professionals or stoma nurses listening, as far back as the 70s, there were people who were trying to classify different types of hernias. So you may have heard them referred to as certain um, different names, so integumentary parastomal hernia, as we call it now, subcutaneous hernias, intrastomal hernias, pseudoprestomal hernias. The definition of them or the classification of them doesn't matter because ultimately the function and, and the remedy and the prevention of them is still very much the same in terms of stomal therapy nurse practice. So for the purpose of this episode and for, for modern terms, I just refer to parastomal hernias as is or a hernia. Okay, so when I spoke about the fact that parastomal hernia is more of a latent complication, hernias around stomas can occur even up to immediately following surgery because they are an incisional hernia. Anytime we're cutting into the body, we are creating a risk for developing herniation. But statistically speaking, the most likely time to develop a hernia, even though you can have one at any time in your stoma life, the most likely time to develop one is going to be within the first 12 months of your surgery, so creating the stoma. Let's look at more stats or statistics. Now, it's very difficult to explain exact statistics of the incidence of stomal hernias because a collection of the data is, is quite difficult. Some people who develop a hernia are not often recorded. They may choose not to do anything about it, or they may be told that there's nothing that can be done about it. And so reporting of the incidence of stomas is quite difficult. But the statistics that we do have suggest that hernias are most common for people who have an what we call an end colostomy. So where the, the end part of your colon is brought up and stitched to your skin. And incidences of colostomy herniation can be as high as 48 to 50 percent. So almost half of people who have a colostomy may go on to develop some version of a parastomal hernia. Loop colostomies are the second most common and the reasons for these I'm going to talk about in a minute. But colostomies are the most common stoma types that can develop a hernia. Parastomal hernias around an ileostomy, so an end ileostomy or a loop ileostomy, can occur in up to around 30% of people. This all ranges, 30 to 35% of people. And as I said, the statistics are very different for everybody because data collection is quite tricky. Mm. And we can even see some parastomal hernias developing in people who have a urostomy. There's a false perception in some people that think that because they've only had a small section of bowel used to create a urostomy or ileal conduit, that their risk of getting a hernia is a lot less. Yes, there is a less of risk of developing a hernia, but that's not to say that you won't still develop one if you have a urostomy. We've treated many people who have developed hernias behind their ileal conduits that have needed repair. So in general, there's a little bit of a trend. So end stomas or terminal stomas, where the piece of bowel has been completely separated, tend to have more of an incidence of developing hernia, whereas loop stomas or, or sometimes what we call temporary stomas, although some of them aren't temporary, loop stomas have a slightly less incidence of developing a hernia. And reasons for that aren't completely explained in research. Let's talk risk factors, because although I speak a lot about the 
uh, high incidences of developing a parastomal hernia if you have a stoma, it seems to be a very worrying thought for a lot of people. So I want to reassure you that not everybody will develop a parastomal hernia. However, there are patient risk factors and surgical risk factors that may increase the likelihood that you might develop a hernia. Let's talk patient risk factors first. There are certain body types and certain physical conditions that people may have that might increase their risk of developing a hernia. So for instance, people over 60 are more likely to develop a hernia than a lot younger people. And the reasons for that might be something to do with perhaps as uh, with the older population, the activity levels may decrease, muscle mass may start to reduce heading into old age, and so the strength in the abdominal wall may not be as strong as somebody obviously in their 20s who is quite active. So if you're over 60, you might have an increased risk of developing a hernia. Obesity is another major risk factor for developing a parastomal hernia. If you are a person whose BMI falls into the category of obesity, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will develop a parastomal hernia, but you have to look at things like people's body type, and particularly in men. Men carry a lot of fatty tissue around the belly area, and so we actually tend to see more men with larger abdomens developing parastomal hernias. So if you have a body mass index that is greater than 30, you may find that you are at increased risk of developing a hernia, whether you're a male or a female. But it's important to know that with a larger abdomen around that stoma is going to increase a lot of that intra-abdominal pressure, which may force that widening or that hole that we've created to put the stoma through it might force it to become stretched and bigger and perhaps big enough that a stomal hernia forms in that area due to the pressure involved in a very large or even perhaps a very pendulous abdomen. For ladies who have got very large abdomens that sag quite a bit, the tension on that area around the stoma can pull or tug or drag and it may create a wider opening for excess bowel to slip through and herniate. So in general, if your waist circumference, male or female, if your waist circumference is greater than 100 centimetres, you have an increased risk of developing a parastomal hernia. People that do a lot of heavy lifting or hard physical labour are also at increased risk of developing a hernia. And again, it goes back to that force or that tension that's placed on the abdominal core muscles that may weaken that hole or may stretch or create a space for bowel to slip through. And normally when you first have your stoma formed, your stoma nurse or the nurses will tell you avoid heavy lifting for a period of weeks. The same technically doesn't have to continue once your stoma is established, but this is where we start to broaden out into the area of prevention of hernias. So support garments for people who are physically active or people who perform a lot of physically hard labor, where you're engaging those abdominal muscles quite frequently preventative measures such as support garments which I'm going to talk about later will be helpful for these people because you might have an increased risk of parastomal hernia too. And then there's some other risk factors that look at comorbidities so things like people who have chronic coughs where they're where they're tensing those tummy muscles quite frequently with coughing so for instance those that have um, pulmonary disease so COPD people who have chronic chest infections or people with emphysema, smokers in particular, people who do a lot of coughing are at increased risk of developing a hernia as well. And then there's things like people who have been on steroid therapy, people who have immune disorders, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, some cancers. Uh, they can all be somewhat contributing factors to whether or not you develop a hernia. Let's look at surgical factors. It's believed that certain surgical factors can also contribute to the increased incidence of hernias. And the most common ones that are thought to have contributed it are things like the uh, emergency formation of stomas. So depending on how quickly somebody has to have a stoma formed, 
the placement or non-marking of a stoma may contribute to perhaps being in a slightly awkward position or not necessarily being in the most appropriate place. And so that can place undue pressure on that area and it can create a stoma. Again, the stoma type, depending on uh, what type of stoma you have, as I mentioned earlier, if you've got a colostomy, there's an increased chance of having a hernia. Whereas some surgeons, depending on the reason for surgery, may choose to do a different stoma type. Sometimes the technique of the surgeon or the relevant experience or qualification of the surgeon may have an impact as well. And that's not to say that there are better surgeons than others in terms of stomas. It's more the fact that there are certain teachings or certain ways of creating a stoma that may or may not have an effect on whether or not someone goes on to develop a hernia. But one of the most important things that's come up in the research that tends to be an issue and has had a little bit of research done into it is the actual size of the stoma orifice or the aperture or the size or diameter of the hole that they cut in the abdomen to bring the piece of bowel through. And this might make a bit more sense as to why a colostomy has a higher incidence of herniation than say an ileostomy or a urostomy. So the size of the stoma opening that they bring the piece of bowel through, research suggests that if it is wider or above three centimeters, so approximately two thirds of the intestinal width, that there is an increased risk for that area being stretched and creating a hernia. Now, again, the research is not definitive because we can't exactly do two stomas on one person and create them different sizes and expect to measure the same thing. So there's a lot of mediocre reports or even possibly low quality evidence to suggest that that is a contributing factor. But it certainly seems to make sense that the larger you make a hole, the, the less support there will be around that orifice. And so it leaves it weaker and more prone to developing a hernia. And so they are some of the important surgical factors that may be taken into account as to why people with a stoma go on to develop or don't develop a parastomal hernia. Now, in talking about the multiple potential causes and the risks of developing a hernia, it's equally as important, therefore, as stoma nurses that we assess people adequately uh, for their potential risk of developing a hernia. And so these things that we consider as stoma nurses are things like proper preoperative preparation. So that's your preoperative site marking. If you are uh, fortunate to see a stoma nurse before your operation, the site marking that we do where we're marking the best possible place to put a stoma aims to locate it within what we call the rectus abdominis muscle, which is the, the long tummy muscle that supports your core. And you've got two that run down either side of the belly button. They connect your ribs to your pelvis. They are what keep you upright and keep your abdomen nice and taut. So when we are sighting stomas, we try and put it within that muscle to give it support. And that's something that we do as part of preoperative counseling and preoperative site marking. That's one thing that we do as stoma nurses to potentially minimize the risk of developing a hernia. We also look at things like preoperative things that a patient could do before their operation, quitting smoking, physical exercise, losing weight, getting in touch with a stoma group, um, identifying any comorbidities or other illnesses that somebody might have, um, in particular their BMI or their, their weight status, so that we can recognize that they will be at an increased risk of possibly developing a hernia. And we can, as stoma nurses, put certain things in place so that that risk is, is minimized, not eliminated because we can't ever eliminate the possibility that somebody has a stoma, but we can certainly do things to minimize that risk. Now, what happens if you are a person with a stoma and you do go on to develop a parastomal hernia? Now, it's very important to make you all aware that it is not the end of the world if you do develop a parastomal hernia. Many people live quite satisfactorily with a parastomal hernia and it does not sometimes affect their pouching system. They just happen to have a bit of an unsightly bulge, whether it's reducible or non-reducible, and they can still live quite capably with that hernia. 
Where we start getting into trouble, however, are in incidences where the hernia can protrude so greatly that it a can affect the pouching regime so you might have difficulty getting your pouching system to stick and adhere and b if it is so large that it has the risk of developing what we call incarceration sometimes you'll also hear to it referred to as a strangulated hernia and what that simply means is with enough bowel protruding and filling through that small hole that we've made through your abdominal wall if enough bowel gets into that space, what can happen is the small aperture of that hole that it's slipping to can swell and it becomes tight. And if the bowel is trapped in that sac in front of the abdominal muscle, what happens is it can cut off the blood supply. And if it cuts off the blood supply, that piece of bowel becomes very inflamed and you will become quite sick and ill. You will experience abdominal cramping, abdominal pain, you might have nausea and vomiting, and you might become very acutely unwell in a relatively short space of time. Most people will also find that their stomas stop working or functioning because the bowel is trapped and inflamed. And in these cases, incarcerated or strangulated hernias do often require admission to hospital. And those who do suffer these symptoms will usually go on to have surgical correction because if that bowel is not released and, and regains blood supply, it will die and you will become very ill and it becomes a medical emergency. But as a general rule, surgical correction of a parastomal hernia is not the first go-to point if you do develop that bulge or that protrusion. And the reason is there is no guarantee that surgical correction of a parastomal hernia will prevent it from reoccurring in the future. So if we were to surgically correct every parastomal hernia that somebody developed, there's no reason to say that it wouldn't happen again. The hole is still there, and that means that there will still always be a weak point where the stoma is brought through that could create a hernia again. So that's why surgery is not often the very first go-to procedure when somebody develops a hernia. If your stoma is still functioning well and you're not having too many issues with your pouching technique, then your surgeon may suggest that we do nothing in the interim. If it's a reducible hernia, there are other techniques uh, and that your stoma nurse can recommend that can help manage that hernia in a safe way. And I'll talk about that in just a second, but let's go back to corrective surgical techniques. When they do repair a hernia, there's different techniques that they can use to do that. And I'm not going to go too deep into it unless you're a surgeon who happens to be listening to this podcast and then I'm just telling you what you already know. But with a hernia repair, sometimes simple corrective surgery might only involve making a small incision around the stoma or, or laterally in around that area to poke the piece of bowel back in. And then they may decide to suture the edges or reinforce those edges with some suturing so that that hole is reduced, um, which reduces the likelihood of bowel slipping through it again, and it gives it a bit of support and structure. Other techniques can be different too, and they might include using mesh. So they might put a layer of mesh around that stoma aperture to prevent further bowel from slipping through into that space. But again, these techniques aren't guarantees that herniation won't happen again, but they are corrective techniques that may help to reduce the hernia that has already developed and they may or may not prevent future issues with parastomal hernia. It also depends on a person's wellness or their ability to cope with another surgery. For some people, depending on the reason for them having their stoma, if they are particularly unwell or if they have certain medical conditions that prevent them from undergoing a lot of other surgeries, that may not be an option for them. And so management techniques um, in terms of pouching systems and support garments may be the only option for these people if surgery is not a consideration. But quite often during surgical hernia repair, depending on the level of the hernia or how big it may be and the surgery that's required, uh, some of these techniques can actually be quite simple and surgeons 
most often will use some sort of mesh to prevent hernia from happening uh, again in these operations. Some may be able to close the defect with just a couple of sutures, but they're probably the main techniques that they use to help keep that bowel from slipping back into that sac or that area in front of the abdominal wall muscle. All right, I've talked enough about surgeons. Let's get back to stomal therapy practice and the techniques and the, the solutions that we come up with to help prevent or to help manage parastomal hernias. Now, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on in the podcast, sometimes when you do have a hernia present, it can mess or, or make your pouching system quite difficult because you may or may not be able to get a relatively flat or even a convex pouch to seal correctly around an external bulge. So from a practicality point of view, if you've gone a certain amount of time with a particular pouch that you like and you use and it's always been very secure, when you develop a hernia or if you develop a hernia, that can change things quite significantly. Your stoma may change in size. With each external bulge or tension, it can pull the stoma quite flat and the diameter of that size can increase. So from one perspective, you may need to change the size of the hole that you either have pre-cut or that you cut to accommodate that wider stoma size. Additionally, you may find that uh, with a bulge or an external bulge, the surface tension of the skin underneath the pouching system that you use can cause skin irritation with the constant stretching of that skin underneath your pouch. And with enough tension, that can cause sometimes some skin uh, contact allergic dermatitis reactions, or it can even create um, dryness, flakiness, and general stretching and irritation and itchiness of that skin underneath your pouch. If you have got quite a sizable bulge, any flexible edges or, or the tapered shape of the flange that you use may not fit correctly around that different surface area because it's no longer completely flat. So it may be a case where a stomal nurse may need to review your pouching system. and We may need to make recommendations for different products that might be able to accommodate a hernia. So for instance, you may choose to go from a convex bag to a flat bag because a convex bag may be applying too much pressure around a stoma if there is that outward protrusion. It might push up against the convexity too much and you may find it causes pressure injuries and you may find it causes the edges of your bag to lift. Additionally, you may find that we may need to introduce the use of barrier sprays or wipes to protect that delicate skin that's being stretched underneath. And in some cases, we can even use different creams and lotions to rub into the skin to maintain that moisture and elasticity of the skin to prevent it from tearing with each bulge that comes out with a hernia. In pouching techniques also, we may choose to use accessory products like border extenders to help secure the edges of your pouch down to your skin in that outward curving shape. And one of the most recent additions to the stoma product market has been the use of what we call concave bags. Coloplast recently brought out the use of a concave bag, which is the opposite of convex if you know the differences. So convex gives your stoma a push out. Concave gives it a push in the opposite direction to accommodate that outward bulge of your stoma. Okay, so convex is for pushing inward stomas. Concave is for accommodating outward stomas. That's the easiest way I can describe it. And this is a relatively new technology that's just come onto the market and, you know, some people are already trialing it. But that's just to mention that there are alternative options available to get a securely fitted pouch if you do happen to have a parastomal hernia. But to determine what exactly it is that you would require, you'd need to get in touch with a stomal therapy nurse. And we recommend that every time. If you think you've got a hernia, contact your stoma nurse who can sort out any pouching or skin issues that you may be developing as a result. Wearing a what we call a support garment during the day, so during physical activity, during periods of working out, when you are upright and moving, where there's more pressure exerted on your abdomen from standing upright, we may suggest that you wear a support garment. A support garment can come in the form of briefs 
or boxers shorts um, or underwear type support where the waistband is modified and very elastic and firm fitting to help support and stabilize the abdominal muscles when you are standing. So it provides a bit of extra structure in the form of a piece of clothing or a garment that you wear so that those muscles remain stable when you are standing upright. These garments can also come in the form of a Velcro elastic belt, almost like a girdle, uh, for those of you who are familiar with those, where you would wrap it around your waist and you can formally fit it so that you wear it underneath your clothing and it provides that same level of support to your abdomen. Now they do come in different sizes for different people, so the same way that you would order your underwear, you would order the relevant size to suit your shape. And you can also order these garments in different pressure gradients. So you can order garments that have what we call a light support. So that may be for people who don't have a hernia yet, but just want to have a preventative measure to feel more stable in the abdomen. You can get support garments that have moderate support. So for people who may have a very small or a slight hernia that they can choose to wear right through to stoma support garments that have quite a firm support and they are quite tight and elastic so that if you do have an established hernia that they will provide a firm structure so that that hernia doesn't continue to bulge out when you are upright during the day. Now these support garments are available on the stoma appliance scheme but there is an allowance they are a restricted level two item, which means you can only order your maximum amount allowed in the, in the calendar year, and there are no extensions on that. So no stoma nurse approval will allow you to order more support garments in that year if you have already ordered your maximum quantity. And the quantities that you can have on the Australian Stoma Appliance Scheme is either six support pants or underwear garments, or three belts. You can have a combination. So for instance, one support belt and perhaps two pairs of underwear, but you cannot exceed the allowance after this. Otherwise, you will have to self-purchase these garments and you will be charged out-of-pocket fees for getting any more. But we tend to find most people who either order just the briefs or the pants or even just a belt, we often advise in the initial stages, order two, one to wear, one to wash. And that way, if any changes in your abdominal size or any conditions that mean that you might uh, add or lose weight in that year, you still have an allowance to go ahead and order more in the future, should your circumstances change. Now, FYI, they also come in different colors if anybody's into that, but there's only really three colors, which is black, white, and skin color. I don't know about any of you guys, but I don't fancy a bright purple stoma support garment. Most of those three colors, either black, white or neutral, will do the trick because you can wear them under your clothing um, without being seen too much. Majority of people do find that they might even get one color of each kind, but that's up to you and that's personal preference. But the principle still stands. As long as you don't exceed your allowance for the year, you can order up to that amount. So the next question that we often get asked is, how do I know what size I am? And this is where we start talking about the measurements for measuring your garment size. And it's a little bit different to what you might normally think. A lot of people just assume that they can order the relevant underwear size the same as their normal clothing underwear size. And that's not necessarily true because we have to take a certain measurement that starts in the waist area, but we measure around your stoma waist size. So where we would normally, if somebody said to you, you want to measure your waist size, you would bring it up to the small of your abdomen where your belly button is. So the smallest part of your waist. That's not how we measure for stoma support garments. Then there is a technique that you can do, or you could see a stoma nurse who can measure for you to determine what the relevant size garment is that you require. All right, so to measure yourself uh, in preparation for ordering a support garment, you'll need a tape measure of some description, and you might need somebody to help you uh, in this instance, depending on your mobility and depending how well you can see a tape measure, somebody may need to assist you. 
So first of all, you want to be lying flat on your back on a firm surface and you want to be lying there for a few minutes. If you suspect that you do have a hernia, you want to allow time for that bowel to reduce, if at all, because that will then give you an accurate measurement. Because if you do have a hernia and you measure your abdomen while standing up, it's going to be bigger than the accurate size that you need if you're lying down and your stomach is flat. So first of all, you want to be lying flat on your back. And you're going to take your tape measure and you're going to wrap it around your waist, but you're going to have it sit and attach where your stoma sits. So you want to have the tape measure measuring the widest part of your abdomen, including your pouch. So you want to have it wrapped around the pouch where your stoma sits. And this will give you your circumferential measurement or the size that you need so that you can look through your catalogs and order the appropriate garment in the size that you actually need. Now with a stoma support belt, so that's the ones that wrap around your waist with Velcro, you also need to measure your width, which means that's up and down, not just a waist circumference, because these belts do come in different widths. They can either be very thin, so around 17 centimeters, right through to quite large widths, so up to about 30 centimeters. And that's to accommodate for differences in abdominal size. So somebody who might have a very large abdomen um, may benefit from a wider support garment as opposed to someone who's quite petite and only needs a smaller width. So if you've measured your waist size and you need a support belt, not a support brief or support underwear, make sure that you measure five centimeters below the hernia and up and over the hernia to your waist. That's your actual waist. So you want, that will give you the approximate width that you need. So once around your waist, so waist circumference or stoma waist circumference, and then above and below, five centimeters above and five centimeters below. That will give you an appropriate measurement to select your stoma support garment. And this is when you can look through the product range of support garments that will fit your size and your measurement. Whether or not you choose underwear or a support belt doesn't matter. But a thing to note is if you do measure your circumference and you find that you are at the top part of that measurement, so say for instance uh, 10 to 20 centimetres, and this is way out of proportion, but if you are at 20 centimetres, please order the next size up because otherwise you may find that the next size down might be a bit too tight and you may become uncomfortable in that size. So if in doubt, if you are right at the end of that last few centimeters of that size or the top end, order the next size up because you cannot return these garments. Once the Medicare has paid for them and they have been delivered to you, they are in your possession and stoma associations and stoma uh, groups will not take them back because they've been in your hands and it is a infection control risk and it is a Medicare issue because they've already distributed it and subsidized the cost of it. So make sure you're measuring correctly when you order the correct size. One of the other questions that we do often get asked as stoma nurses is, I've seen stoma support garments with a hole cut out or can I cut a hole out to accommodate the bag? Now, a lot of times people don't like stoma support garments and their compliance and their adherence to using them regularly is hindered or, or people don't like using them because they feel that it blocks off the function of their stoma. It's too tight and they may end up with skin problems or even leakage. Now, unfortunately, as with the nature of how hernias form, by cutting a hole in that support garment, you are in fact creating a new weak point in that fabric. And that will not provide your stoma with the correct support that it needs to prevent a hernia from reoccurring or occurring or even starting one in the first place. So it's very important that you don't cut holes to accommodate bags because the research is not conclusive that cutting a hole will still provide you with the correct support. And I know that there are some garments out there, particularly in other countries, that do provide a hole that's cut out. But the important thing is that you don't cut a hole because that will decrease the range of support that that garment is designed to provide to you. If you do find that you have issues with leakage to do with your support garment, get in touch with a stomal therapy nurse because there are interventions that we can suggest to you that may help 
preventing those problems because we want to encourage you to use your stoma support garment as much as possible to prevent that incidence of hernia developing. Now stoma support garments should really only be worn during the daytime when you are upright or when you are very active. At night time when you're lying flat there is not the same pressure in the abdomen and so we often advise that you can take your support garment off at night because if you do sleep with your support garment on it can cause skin irritations from laying on it it can get hot and so in general we don't recommend wearing a support garment at night because you don't need as much support when you're lying flat it's only when you are active during the day that you should be applying your stone support garment and when you are applying it, we recommend that you apply it first when you are lying down because, again, it will allow any pre-existing or existing hernias, if retractable, to reduce back in so that you can apply your garment properly with the right fit so that when you stand up, that hernia has more support and structure to prevent it from just bulging out straight away. So this is something that you may also need assistance with if you are not quite mobile or if you are unable to apply a stoma support garment yourself, you may need somebody, a friend, uh, a loved one, a carer to help you with this technique. But often we will tell you, apply your garments when you are lying down before you stand up. Now I say all of this, but let's talk prevention of hernias in the first place. And in particular, when you have had a stoma formed, we're talking about around six to eight weeks after your operation. So light duties in those first few weeks after your surgery. So that's things like walking, light exercise, but no heavy duty exercise, especially heavy lifting, which might engage those core muscles a bit too much when they are already left vulnerable to developing a hernia. When you do return to work, a lot of people work in an occupation that requires lifting or even those people who don't have a job that requires lifting. Many people have a family. They may have young children. They may be quite active within the home. And so lifting young children, which can be quite heavy, lifting boxes off shelves will all engage those abdominal muscles. So you need to make sure that you are using correct lifting technique after having a stoma formed. And it's always recommended that if you are resuming these activities, that you get a light support garment for prevention of developing a hernia, whether it's in underwear form or a wraparound belt form, we recommend that you do use a stoma support garment after your surgery. Now for correct lifting techniques, we always suggest not to lift by leaning forward. A lot of people have the tendency to lift from their stomach. It's important when you are lifting to bend your knees. So squat right down and lift from your knees and not from your core, so your abdomen. So you, whatever you're lifting, you need to keep it close to your body. And to lift, you need to straighten your legs. If you've ever seen little tiny toddlers bend down to pick something up, they squat from the legs because they've got that innate knowledge it's ingrained into them that that is the natural physical process of bending down to pick something up you don't see little children leaning over from the waist to pick things up it's something that we've learned as adults in how to move so if you've ever seen little children lift like they do squat right down from the legs bend from the knees not from the waist that will ensure that you're engaging your core muscles properly when you do lift an object Always avoid turning or twisting your body when you are lifting. So stay in front of or in line with the object that you're lifting. And if you are new to a stoma and you are contemplating getting back to activities, avoid all heavy lifting for anywhere up to three months after your surgery. So six to 12 weeks, avoid heavy lifting. Light exercise is fine and we recommend light exercise, but avoid heavy lifting for the reasons that I've just mentioned. For things like sports, getting back to sporting activities, if you are quite active in the sports realm or leisurely activities, you can wear a stoma support garment underneath your clothing for these, and that's for prevention of a hernia. You can wear support garments underneath bathing suits. You can wear support garments underneath sporting clothes. They also act as a small protective garment, especially if you are doing high impact activities where there's a risk of being knocked. Um, it's always advisable to wear an extra garment just for a little bit of added protection as well. 
Now, at the end of the day, if you do have a stoma and you do down the track happen to find that you develop a lump or a bulge, don't be concerned. Get in touch with a stomal therapy nurse who can review the stoma, have a look at the hernia, and then they can discuss with you either different pouching techniques or options that may help accommodate that if you are having issues with your pouching regime, or they may be able to recommend a suitable support garment that can either help to manage that hernia or prevent one if you are concerned that you're going to get one. And at the end of the day, if you do experience severe pain with a protrusion or a lump and that you are very concerned about, if you are becoming increasingly unwell, seek medical assistance immediately because it may be an indication that there is something more severe going on with that piece of bowel. But to recap, parastomal hernias do occur in up to 50% of people who have stomas. They are unfortunately not completely preventable and we do what we can and we suggest techniques and methods that we can so that you don't get one. But if you do happen to get a parastomal hernia, get in touch with your stoma nurse or doctor for an assessment and relevant recommendations for how to either treat that or to correct it. Maintain light duties immediately after your stoma is formed and when you are ready to resume normal activity again, make sure you get yourself a stoma prevention garment, so a light support garment, or if you do undertake quite heavy duty activities, get yourself a firm support garment. They are available to you under the Stoma Appliance Scheme, so the group or the membership that you pay to a stoma association, Medicare will subsidise the cost of a certain amount of garments per calendar year. If you want to look at the range of stoma support garments out there, you can jump online and have a look at several different websites. Two of the most common ones are either the SALTS website, their simplicity range of briefs um, can be looked at for ordering garments. Otherwise, the other website is the Omnigon website where they provide um, stoma support solutions in various formats, so either briefs, belts, and they come in either the Diamond Plus, the Isoflex, or the Cool Knit format. So they're the, the different strengths and different fabrics that they use to create those garments. So that's on the Omnigon website. I believe another one that's also out there is the Statina range, uh, which do Corsinelle. So they do briefs as well with different support levels, and they can also be found on their website too. If you are concerned about your ordering codes or product um, quantities or anything like that, you can get in touch with either your stoma association, you can jump online, or you can contact your stomal therapy nurse. Well, that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you for listening to this episode where we've talked about beating the bulge of parastomal hernias. If you're tuning in to us today, you might notice that it's a little bit nippy outside. We are in the midst of winter and the cold weather. And here's a handy hint for you guys who do wear stoma pouches. The hydrocolloids that you use can get pretty chilly in the winter. So to get better adhesion on your pouches, try and warm them up before you start your pouching regime. Now, me as a stoma nurse, I like to tuck it underneath my arm while I'm preparing other supplies so that it warms that up a little bit. But you can use whatever technique you like to make sure that the hydrocolloid gets nice and warm and soft so that when you pop it on your body around your stoma, the heat will help the adhesion of that pouch to your skin. There's a handy tip for you guys during these winter months. I hope you've enjoyed the content that you've listened to today regarding parastomal hernias. If you've got any questions or comments, you can either contact your stoma nurse, or if you like what you're listening to on the Austrian Nurse Project, you can jump onto Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube, and you can leave a rating or a comment on these episodes. I very much appreciate it. Join us next week for another fun-filled episode of the Oz to Me Nurse Project. I'm Felicity and I'm coming to you from down under, just like where your stoma is. Thanks, listeners. Bye.